Hello, welcome to today's program of Study the Word. This program is sponsored by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at the corner of Big Ben and Geyer Road right there in Kirkwood. We'd love for you folks to come and be with us. Consider this your invitation, personal, to assemble with us. If you don't know the area, please check out our website. It'll also have the times of services on there. So please come by if you're ever in the area. We're dealing with a Bible question that has come our way. Today's question is, do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. We hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour. Folks, if you have a Bible question on your mind, we'll deal with it on this program. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. A question that is on your mind, chances are it's on the minds of other people. That's why people continue to tune in from week to week, and we hear from so many of our viewers. And thank you so much for tuning in each and every week. It really means a lot to us. It tells us that, that there are people out there that want to study the Word of God. They don't want to hear stories. They don't want to hear philosophy. They just want to hear what the Bible has to say about all the different subjects that we're dealing with. So thank you for being with us. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have a question on your mind. At the end of the program, we'll put that mon no phone number back up. And so you can take advantage of, of our free Bible study helps. Okay. So let's deal with today's question. Do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Well, the best place to begin with would be the concept of a priest. Who is a priest? Well, if we open up our Bibles, we're going to be going to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And he's writing to Christians there, Peter is. And he says in verse 9, You are a, rose, uh, uh, excuse me, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So what Peter acknowledges here is that the Christians are part of a royal priesthood. Now we know under the old law, there was the, the Levitical priesthood. Only those of the tribe of Levi could serve as priests. Jesus Christ came, and we've had studies where we know that we're no longer under the Old Testament. We're under the new law, the gospel. That's what Jesus Christ brought to bring unity amongst all of us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18 talks about Jesus coming and breaking down that wall between the Jew and the Gentiles, which was the old law, the law of Moses. And of course, people who want to bind that on people today are, are in error. But you know, when we get over to the New Testament, we find that there's a reason why Christians, all Christians are considered priests based on Romans chapter 12. Because under the Old Testament, the priests there would offer animal sacrifices on behalf of the people. The people would bring them animals to be slaughtered to offer as a sacrifice to God. Well, those animals were offered, but we know in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, which is why Jesus had to come and shed his blood. But in Romans chapter 12, getting back to the concept of priests and offerings, it says in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, that's what we do every week. We, we want to find out what is the will of God. And the only way you can know that is to study the scriptures, because you can't know what God thinks. You can only know what God has revealed to us. And he put his mind on paper, so we have the inspired word of God, which it tells us in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now let's get back to the subject at hand. Am I to confess my sins to a priest? Well, we're all priests. And 
We're part of a royal priesthood. All Christians are. There's that equality right across the board. Well, let's talk a little bit about sin for a moment. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what do we need to do about our sins? Well, we need our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus shed his blood. Matthew 26 verse 28, Jesus said, This is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We need our sins remitted. In Acts chapter 2, when people needed to know what they needed to do to become a child of God, Peter said to them in Acts 2 and verse 38, he said, um, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for what? The remission of sin. In Acts 22 and verse 16, Saul, who we later know as the Apostle Paul, he was told, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin calling on the name of the Lord, doing it by his authority. We need our sins remitted. But what happens when we become a Christian and then we sin? Do we have to get baptized again and again? Well, no, no, because in Jesus, and we're baptized into Jesus, Romans 6 and verse 3, in Jesus are all the spiritual blessings, and one of those is the forgiveness of sin. That's talked about over in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. He says in him, verse 7 of chapter 1, in who? In Jesus, he was talking about there. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So we can have forgiveness of sin. When we become a Christian, that doesn't mean we have permission to sin now, but because we are now Christians, we can pray directly to the Father for forgiveness of sin. That's one of the blessings of being in Jesus, becoming a Christian. I'm over in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And this is addressed to Christians. And please pick up on the fact that John includes himself when he says the word we and us. So, 1 John, not the gospel according to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is 1 John near the end of our Bibles. So in 1 John, he mentions in verse 8, if we, including himself, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So what he's saying here that as as Christians, I can't even get on this TV program and say, I never sinned. I'd be a liar and the truth would not be in me. So Chuck, what do you do if you sin? Well, God is faithful and just to forgive us. So I need to confess my sin and I need to repent. I need to turn away from it. That's what we are told to do. In Acts chapter 8, we find that when Simon the sorcerer obeyed the gospel, he was baptized into Christ. And shortly thereafter, he sinned. Peter didn't tell him to get baptized again. He just told him, he said, you need to repent of your wickedness. You need to repent. Now, if you'll notice, none of these passages say anything about when you sin, go confess your sins to a priest. No, he's saying you need to go to the Father through Jesus, which, by the way, we have in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Remember, he just said, that if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. Now, that's not permission to sin because of what he says in chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, my little children, these things I write to you that that you may not sin. Don't sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we can go to the Father personally. We can go to the Father through Jesus, praying for forgiveness of sin. Jesus is our mediator, Paul told Timothy. And, and that mediator, Jesus brought reconciliation. And so we can approach our God. I don't need to go through a mediator other than through Jesus. I don't have to go through, through a priest, through Jesus, to the Father. No, not at all. I just need to go directly to the Father through Jesus. That's the joy of becoming a Christian. And after all, since all Christians are priests, if somebody says, Chuck, should I confess my sins to the, 
to my to a priest or you can do confess them to yourself because you, if you're a christian you're also a priest you're a saint all christians are saints did you know that you know when when you read these epistles that were written to different churches you find that term is used over and over again Philippians 1, for example. Philippians 1, Paul wrote to the Philippians saying, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. A saint, somebody who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, who's been set apart, who's to be holy and to serve the Lord. Now, I know in, in certain religious realms, they have changed the concept of saint. They've changed the concept of priest by saying not everybody's a priest. Look, I'm just, this program isn't to get into why different religious groups teach what they do. Religious groups can come up with their own doctrines, their own creeds, their own manuals. They can do whatever they want. It's not my place to tell them what to do, but what I do here on this program is tell you what God says. And I want you to be a follower of the Lord and not a follower of man. You don't want to be a part of some man-made religion some religious sect, you want to follow the Lord. And so when a person asks me, should, do I have to confess my sins to a priest? Well, if you want to know what the Lord says, but if you talk to some man, you're going to find people who will say, well, yes, that's exactly what you have to do. Now, they're not going to base it upon the Bible. They might base it upon their church doctrine. But I'm to teach Second John 9, the doctrine of Christ. We're told to abide in the doctrine of Christ. If you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. That's 2 John 9. Remember, we read from 1 John. And so 2 John 9 tells us this. Now, let me just take a few minutes to talk about the concept of confessing our faults to one another. So the Bible does talk about that person might say, well, maybe this is where it originated from, the concept of confessing to a priest. There's nothing wrong with confessing our wrongs to somebody. But there's some things we really need to know, and the scriptures will help us. Over in James chapter 5, he says in verse 16, Confess your trespass, your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, let's just spend a few minutes on this text and learn some things. First of all, confess your trespasses to one another. So, I would ask the question for people who say, No, Chuck, you have to confess your sin to a priest. My question is, does that priest confess his sins to you? See, here it says, in the Bible, God said, confess your faults to one another. It's just one, one way, to one another. Now, here's something else that's really important. He says in this, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Who's the righteous man in this text? Because he's saying, confess your faults one to another. So we get two people here. He says, confess your, you confess your faults to him, he confesses your faults. His, his faults to you. Why do that? He says, well, because the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You mean we can pray for each other? Yeah. Who's the righteous man in this scenario? Both. What's that tell you? You see, it's saying that if I confess my faults to somebody, I've already made it right with the Lord. And vice versa. They've already made it right with the Lord. See, the point is, if I haven't made it right with the Lord, if I tell somebody, man, I just I just stole something, they would tell me, well, first of all, you need to give it back and you need to pray to God if perhaps you can be forgiven of your sin. That's what Peter told Simon over in Acts chapter 8. Pray to God. He told him, pray to God if perhaps you will be forgiven of your transgression. And so what you find in James chapter 5 is that, you know, None of us are perfect, but when we pray for forgiveness of sin and we're striving to do what is right, walking in the light, as John 1 verse 7 says, we need to walk in the light. 
If we do that, we are considered a righteous person. So as a righteous person, who's not perfect, of course, as a righteous person, I can hear the faults from somebody else and I can pray for them and they can hear my faults or my, my trespasses, put it that way. Don't want to lighten sin in any ways. I can confess to them, you know, I, I struggle with this and I've already made it right with the Lord. Well, they can pray for me. They're a righteous person. I'm a righteous person. Being righteous means that we're, we're doing what is right and we're trying to be godly in an ungodly world. So, this concept of praying for one another is a useful tool. It holds us accountable. You know, I realize there's organizations out there that, that want you to have somebody that you can call to hold you accountable. Well, that's nothing new. That's part of the Word of God and what the, the Lord's plan was all along. This is why our Lord instituted the church. It was part of the eternal plan. The church is the body of Christ. You read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. That's why, why brethren look out for one another. Don't you read that in, in uh, Galatians chapter 6? That's what family does. He says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brother, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Did you get that? If a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore them. Well, wait a minute. Well, who am I to go to them? You know, we all sin. I'm not perfect. Well, see, you have made it right with the Lord. And the person he's talking about here hasn't made it right with the Lord. Remember, if he's overtaken in the trespass, go to him, encourage him to repent. And now he's right with the Lord. We're to bear one another's burdens, folks. And sadly, in the religious realm, they're getting away from the equality that's supposed to be in Jesus Christ. You know, you go to a passage like Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 28, because of Jesus, he says, there's, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. Jesus broke down those barriers. And so there's to be no distinctions. And we can have different roles, of course. And within a congregation, you could have elders and deacons and teachers and evangelists. But none of them are more important than any of the other members. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. We're all members of the same body, and there needs to be equality there. Have you ever heard of the concept of the clergy-laity distinction? From our Lord's point of view, there is no distinction. We're all one. And so when it comes to this idea of confessing my sins to a priest, and him telling me what I need to do to make it right is so contrary to the word of God because what the Lord wants me to do when I do something wrong is to repent. Repent means to turn away from it and to become stronger. That's what happens when you resist sin. It makes you stronger. You can draw near to God, James chapter 4, and he'll draw near to you. You can resist the wiles of the devil, folks. But the devil doesn't want us to repent. That's the difference. Say, Chuck, if, if everybody sins, what makes you different than the person out there who's not a Christian? Well, the, the major difference is, is being covered by the blood and wanting to do what the Lord wants us to do, where we will sin less and not more. We can overcome. We can grow is what the Bible teaches us to do over there in 2 Peter chapter 3. We grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to increase our faith. And Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the concept of, of, of helping one another is really important within the body of Christ, as we've talked about here, confessing to one another. And I can't stress that enough because people miss that point and think it could be just one way. Now, as I've mentioned before, when it comes to the concept of understanding the seriousness of sin, we don't take it lightly. What is sin? 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 4. A lot of verses that we've been reading to, today come from the book of John, uh, 1 John and 2 John. And so if you want some reading, it doesn't take long to go through those books. So over in uh, 1 
1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So our responsibility is to make sure that at the end of time, now here's the key, that we don't have any sin. How, how can that be? Well, see, people get this idea that at the end of time, if we've done more good things than bad things, we get to go to heaven. That's not in the Bible. What the Bible teaches us, those who go to heaven have no bad thing. Well, who doesn't have any bad thing? The people who have received forgiveness of their sin. This is why First John was given. God is faithful and just to forgive us. But if we don't confess, why would we think we'll be forgiven? Why do we think that God's just going to overlook that? No. This is why Jesus went to the cross and died and shed his blood so that we could have the remission of sins that I quoted earlier from Matthew 28. This is why we want to encourage you to make sure that you're covered by the blood and that you do things that are authorized by the word of God. Remember Colossians 3.17. Whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. This is why we want to just get back to the scriptures. Now I know some of the things that we talked about today is disturbing to some people. Or they'll just outright re reject it and say, well, like many of our questions that we deal with, people will say, well, that's not what our church teaches. So be it. All right. But what we want to teach is what the head Jesus taught. You know, Jesus is the head of the church. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, do you know how much authority Jesus has? All of it. All of it. So how much does the church have? None. How much do I have? None. Jesus has all the authority. And so as the head, we need to consult him in all things, which we read just a moment ago in Colossians 3, verse 17. And I hope this program has stirred up within you a desire to ask some Bible questions. You might even put it this way when you're writing your questions or leave it on voicemail. Our church teaches this. What does the Bible say about that? Because sometimes people are led to believe that the things that are being taught are in here, but they're not. Which is why we have been offering the two pamphlets. I mention them every once in a while. And so many people have requested the one pamphlet is 40 things people think are in the Bible that are not. These are things that people are preaching from the pulpit. They say it's in the Bible, but it really isn't. So you need to request that free pamphlet. 40 things that people say are in the Bible that are not. And the other one is 30 things that people are saying is not in the Bible, but it is. You need to request those folks free, along with the other free Bible study helps that we offer. What are some of those things? Well, the one, as I showed last week, is a six lesson free home Bible study course. Doesn't take long to get through this. It's not that thick. It's just short Bible study, and you can fill in the true and false, fill in the blank, send it back, we'll check it over, and we'll return it to you along with your next lesson. Uh, no cost to any of this. It shouldn't cost you to learn the Word of God, folks, but it will require you to sacrifice some time, not a lot. You just need a Bible. Work it at your own speed in the comfort of your own home. Send it back, and uh, we'll send the next lesson to you. And I'm sure you will find it rewarding. It'll answer a lot of other Bible questions that are on your mind. And uh, you can in, do it with some friends, family members, and study together. That would be great. We've also been offering the weekly free home um, bulletin. Excuse me, the bulletin. Um, we print this every week, different articles, at least probably two articles a week. Um, deal with different Bible subjects, and people have been requesting to be put on the mailing list for this. So we're mailing this out throughout the St. Louis area, even into Illinois. Um, so if you would like to request that, again, there's no charge for any of these things. We just want to encourage you to learn God's Word. Remember this program? Study the Word. That's what it's all about. Now, maybe the home Bible course 
not interested. Maybe the weekly bulletin isn't your thing, but you would like a face-to-face -face Bible study. You can do that. I will mention, sometimes people like all three. I've had people that have been on the correspondence course, taken the weekly bulletin, but have also requested a face-to-face -face Bible study. Which you can have your, your pick. All or one or more. Now, the face-to-face -face Bible study is done at a place where you're comfortable with, whether it's at the church building, your home, um, coffee shop, wherever, library, wherever you're comfortable. Um, and if it's just one person, one lady, well, I'll bring another person with me. Don't want you to feel uncomfortable. But folks, if you're interested in a face-to-face -face Bible study where we'll sit around with our Bibles open and deal with different subjects, uh, we'll be glad to do that. So don't hesitate to do that. We've had a lot of, lot of studies going on during the week in all those places, at the building, in people's homes, and via Zoom. So people have been able to stay at home, and I've been able to stay at home. I give them the, uh, the ID number, and we see each other on the Internet, and we have Zoom studies, and I'm doing that during the week. And if you're interested in having a Zoom study due to COVID, be glad to do that. Uh, just let me know. You see the phone number. You can text it or leave it on voicemail. Love to hear from you. Of course, with the texting and voicemail, with the uh, bulletin and the home Bible study course, all you have to do is just leave your name and your address. If you're doing voicemail, sometimes it's really, really difficult to catch the names and some of the street uh, names. And so it doesn't hurt to go ahead and spell them out. Um, and that would be helpful to me because I want to make sure that you receive your, your course. And I will mention this quickly, and that is that I've heard from some people who didn't receive their lesson that we mailed, and also people have contacted me saying, did you receive the lesson I sent back? And I would say no. So I understand that things can happen with our mail system, so please feel free to contact us again if you did not receive it, because usually we mail it out the very next day. Now, the latest you would get it probably would be the end of the week. And so if you haven't received any of the material that you have requested, please let me know and we'll get another copy or another lesson out to you ASAP. And we're just here to help in any way that we can. Now, with a few seconds left here. I just want to invite you to come and assemble with us. The Kirkwood Church of Christ meets every Sunday morning at 9.30. We have a Bible study. And that Bible study goes from 9.30 to 10 after 10. We have a 10-minute break. And then at 10.20, we start our worship service. And then we meet in the afternoon again at 5. We meet for an hour. We would not put you in an uncomfortable situation. Just come, sit, and listen, participate in any way that you would like. And you'd be our honored guest. And of course... We have a midweek Bible study on Wednesdays at 7. We have classes for all age groups. We bring the whole family. We'd love to have you. Again, this has been sponsored by the Kirkwood Church of Christ. Meets at 948 South Geyer Road right there in Kirkwood. Thank you for being with us and have a great day.